And I really hope you guys are excited to hear what our next speaker has to say. Introducing Pilar Orti, director at Virtual Not Distance. Pilar, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon now. I'm in London, so good generic time of the day for everyone. I am going to be talking for about 20, 25 minutes about trust in distributed teams. And for that, I've got a question beforehand, before that. And the question is, do you trust me? Do you trust that I know what I'm talking about? Do you trust that I'm going to entertain you for, as I said, 25 minutes? Would you trust me with your cat? So as you can see, trust is a big word. It is completely context specific. And I recommend that as we're talking, as I'm talking through, through, the, through the talk, that you are constantly checking in with yourself as to what your answers were to my questions. How much do you need to know about me to trust me? And this is a very important question because as we are talking about distributed teams, the need to be able to trust people even though we don't see them. Some of us will be hiring people that we've never met in person. Others will have been suddenly thrown into working with people who we used to work with in the office to not. And you hear a lot, oh, we just need to trust them. Managers need to trust their people. But if you are someone who for personality reasons, for uh, some of your experience, your history, if you find it difficult to trust people when you can't see them most of the time, this might cause you a lot of stress. So it's good to know where we stand personally in our propensity to trust. So I will now <laughs> share my screen. This is always the moment where we hope that everything uh, works well. There we go. So this is how I wanted to start. I wanted to start with this uh, propensity to trust. Those of us who have high propensity will very easily trust people until they prove us wrong. Others who have a lower propensity to trust will probably need a lot more information. And when we're working in a distributed way, when we're working in a distributed team on a distributed organization, we really need to know ourselves very well. We need to know uh, how we are interacting with others. We need to know what we need to do our best work. We need to do this anyway. We need to understand ourselves in any case, but in distributed work, we need a lot more of this uh, self-awareness. So um, as uh, Joao kindly introduced uh, me, I am the director of Virtual Not Distant. We're, uh, some people call it a boutique company. So we're a small company and we help organizations transition to remote, mainly through working with the manager, with the team leader, facilitating time with teams, helping them to see how are we going to work when we're away from the office and also helping um, managers of teams that are already distributed and that we're born. We're born that way. I'm also the host of the 21st Century Work Life podcast, which where I've had the pleasure and I am so in awe of my guests and I've made some friends. <laughs> so if you want to get to know people in your industry or if you want to have great conversations, a podcast, a great thing to do. And through that, I've spoken to uh, people from some of the companies that you will be hearing throughout this um, conference. And indeed, Laurel Farr and Mark Kilby, who are speaking on Wednesday, are they become regular guests, so I am, I'm in awe. Um, I've only been in the space about five years or so. Uh, lots more people. I mean, we were hearing uh, also about how software companies have been, uh, sorry, software companies, software communities have been working in a distributed manner for ages, way before you know I knew anything about this stuff. So um, yeah, so. Just to let you know, in case uh, you've just joined us and you're watching, of course, you're watching on YouTube, I cannot see your comments. So at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll be delighted to get some questions from Joao that you have fed through in Slido, but I cannot see anything. So unfortunately, I won't be able to interact much with you right now. We'll have to wait till the end. So a little bit about my journey uh, uh, as to how, why I've decided to talk to you about this today. In looking at what managers need to do differently when they're working with distributed teams or remote instead of in the office, and I remember that I help people transition. So many of these people are not used to working away from their team members and team members um, and from their managers. 
is what's different. We need a coaching mindset. Yeah, we're 21st century. We know that as managers, we need a coaching mindset as much as we can. Uh, what is it? We need to be const giving constant feedback, but what is it that's different? And so I've captured a lot of what I'm seeing and some of my own thinking and what I'm reading and listening to into this set of principles called visible teamwork. And it's um, at the core of it is that the if you have a manager or the person who's driving or even the team members themselves, it really is about becoming more of a facilitator. What do I need to do? How can I structure the communication in the team so that um, I need to do less supervision and I can get on with some, some real work? And I've divided it into three categories, deliberate communication, which is about the information we need from our colleagues and our team members as people, information that otherwise we might not have access to. The work visibility, we saw a lot of that in um, Carlos' uh, presentation earlier on. We see a lot of the work that helps us to, to feel connected and trust that others know what we're doing. And finally, the concept of planned spontaneity, which I will just leave hanging for now. So this is something that, um, managers, leaders can introduce to help their teams when they're working in a distributed way to be more self-sufficient, but also they're great for self-organization. We don't need someone to be telling us to do uh, how to communicate if we've got something like this. So let's, uh, let's go straight into trust. So um, today in this talk, I'm going to be talking about what do we mean by trust and how it's built, why we need it, do we need it? Do we, do we need to be trusting each other or is there something else we can be doing? And then of course, the link to visible teamwork. I am working through this, um, this set of principles. I've been working on them for about a year and I'm constantly thinking, what am I doing to the space? Is this something that I should be saying? And one of the things I'm looking at is what visible teamwork can be doing to increase trust, but is there also a risk that it might be decreasing it in some way? So uh, let's have a look at uh, trust itself. So yeah, what are the, how do we build trust? So there's one a type of trust, which is affective trust, which is the trust we build when we get to know each other as people, uh, when we have social interactions and we start to trust someone because we know them, we know about them, we know how they're similar to us in some ways. There's also cognitive trust, which is um, building relationships through understanding how people think, through seeing their work. So you could, you could look at it as saying affective is from the heart and cognitive is from the head, from the brain. And there's always one, you know, there's always one that is maybe um, uh, more dominant in ourselves as people, but there's probably a bit of both going on all the time. This is culture specific. So for those of you who are working across time zones, I have to say uh, working globally is not my specialism, but I know enough about it. Um, Spanish living in London, my colleagues uh, in Spain, I work with people in the Netherlands, etc. My husband is Dutch. Uh, I know enough uh, to know that different uh, geographical cultures tend to build trust in different ways. So the kind of interactions they are looking for to trust someone to be able to go, okay, yeah, I trust you. I don't have to worry about you anymore will be different. So this is something to bear in mind. And also in organizations, in some organizations, maybe we have lots of social events and lots of affective trust gets built like that. Others, we don't. We just have very business uh, meetings, business interactions, and we trust each other in that way. So again, this the, the beauty of all of this is there's just not one way of doing anything. If we break down what kind of interactions or what is it that we see in other people and what is it that how do we need to behave so that others trust us, we can think of three things. And uh, first one, benevolence, which is about do I trust that you're going to act in my interest? Are you someone that's not going to stab me in the back? Competence, are you good at what you do? And uh, do you do what you say you're going to do? So you can see also with when we're talking about trust and building trust, it's about what do we need from others to trust them and how do we need to behave to be trusted? And all of this needs information throughout. And of course, you can see how if we're working in a distributed team where we don't see each other every day, uh, depends on schedules, we might not have many interactions throughout the day because of the nature of our work. 
we need to be gathering information. Uh, if we're a new team, uh, we'll need it to start building those relationships. If we're a team that already trusts each other, we can continue like that. But you, were, you know from relationships, you're constantly checking in. And remember that propensity to trust. Some of you will be checking in with that trusting relationship more often than others. And in a team, you're bound to get some sort of diversity around that. One of the things um, that I think is interesting about some of the research that's been done over the past few years uh, um, is uh, we've looked at why is trust important? Well, without trust, we'll be less productive. That's, they've, they've been shown to be links between how much trust there is in a team and its productivity. If we don't trust someone, we might not want to tell them everything we know. <laughs> uh, we might be less likely to help each other uh, and also we're less likely maybe to admit to our mistakes. And you can see how in a team, we want to create that psychological safety. We need to know, especially in our relationship with our managers, we need to know that we can say, look, I messed up. This is how I messed up. Help me to do something about it and let's move on. But if we don't trust that there's not going to be any repercussions, et cetera, we're less likely to do that. And also finally, if we just trust that everyone's getting on with the work, that everyone's acting in the best interest of the team, we'll just get on with our work and not worry about anything else. And something that's been found over, this is from 2016. So it's interesting, the research around trust, I find that a lot of it was done before we had so much access to so much tech. Uh, but, but still, we, we it's still there. It's still there for us to look at us, uh, to look at it. And something that um, this comes from a uh, uh, from a piece from 2016, which has been very nicely summarized by Science for Work in their uh, website, and it says basically, trust in a team is not going to affect us as much if we have a record of our interactions. And I think that's probably the first time that I went, ah, okay. So if we make lots of our interactions visible, then trust doesn't become as important. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm gonna leave up to you. So, but but given uh, given the diversity in our team, we can, you know, I think, I think it makes sense to look at it like that. And finally, and I'm gonna pause in a second, the other part that can affect how we work in a distributed team is the trust we have in the tech we use. If we're using email and uh, um, online meetings platform, then we're probably okay. If we start to add technology, we, we're adding something else that we need to trust. We need to trust it works. We need to trust it always works. We need to trust the people behind the technology. Are they acting in our best interest? Are they reliable? Do they have integrity? Are they competent? So. I'm not going to go into this because this is something actually that I just thought of when I was putting this together, but I think I'm going to leave this with you, that sometimes some behavior might change when we introduce technology and we might interpret it as a lack of trust between team members it might have something to do with your ecosystem. So always check in. So just going to give you a bit of a pause. I'm going to drink some water. And just make a note for yourselves, uh, how does this sound and how do how do, I, do you as a person, how do you relate to, to this? How do you trust? How much information do you need from people? Um, if you are in a management position, then uh, how likely are you to trust people who you can't see? How much information do you need from them? Okay, so with that pause in mind, one thing that is interesting about working in a distributed team and starting, especially we're just starting to set up our communication systems, is how we design our ecosystem. And we've already uh, heard Carlos talk about asynchronous communication. So we already know that we can talk to each other in real time and usually happens. Um, this, this is kind of, this is not this is not a meeting or a conversation. This is a broadcast at the moment. Hopefully later we get a bit of feedback so we can have some communication. But uh, online meetings, the phone, chat kind of, it's almost real time. And then we have asynchronous communication, which is the non-real time email, although people sometimes use email as a near, <laughs> near synchronous. I use, uh, I use Slack and Microsoft Teams and stuff like that as asynchronous because I can put my message there I don't have a Slack open all day and then I wait and then at some point I go and check it in, uh, check the conversation. Many people use it as synchronous, but you can use it at 
you can decide to use it differently. And it's, um, I really find that if we can have a mixture of these uh, uh, ways of communicating, that will suit the team best. Some teams, if you're spread over time zones, forget about synchronous. And you can do it. There's a lot of companies, um, Automatic, they're coming in to talk tomorrow about this. You can do it. Uh, but a lot of the teams will need synchronous. And right now where we are, and also over the last couple of years where more people are going remote, when people are accepting that actually we can work away from each other, it needs a mixture because people need different things. So you can get a lot of clarity with synchronous communication. Async can give you a bit more flexibility. When you're designing your ecosystem, your tool, what are you going to use, your process, what, when, how often, uh, and the behavior. If you are a team leader manager introducing this, or if you're a team member saying, look, guys, we could do with a bit of this, you've got to role model. It's not enough to say, you know, let's use Trello to keep track of our tasks. That's it. And then forget about it. Uh, someone needs to be championing it. Um, and of course, you need your team agreement. You need to decide if I post a message, how long am I going to have to wait for you guys? Uh, we, Carlos was mentioning the stress. And it is true. This can cause stress. There is uh, there's a, some research behind that. That sometimes working across time zones causes stress because of that. We throw something into the team and we go, silence. So we need to have agreed at least the very basics. Um, so the last bit before I go into visible teamwork is task interdependence. And this is about in your team, how do your tasks integrate? Do you work on your task and that's it? You don't need the input from anyone. Um, and, and it's about your team's full output. Or does one person do one thing and then that next person can follow their tasks and then the third person can follow their task? Or do you have to work very closely together? When you're introducing any kind of system, any kind of technology, think about how you work through your tasks because that will then this, this will then help you decide how you're going to use the tools. Don't let the tools tell you how to work. <laughs> and this is one small thing. I mean, th this we could go on for half an hour on this, but um, that's just to plant this seed there with you. So finally, we're saying about building trust, but a lot of the, um, especially if you are making that transition uh, into distributed or you've been made to make that transition, what are the levels of trust? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about open conversations, talking in the open. Have we got those levels of trust in the team? Or actually going to a system of visible teamwork is going to cause a lot of stress, in which case let's start with something small. Or are the levels of trust so high in our team already that, you know, Pilar, we don't need anything of what you're going to tell us about because people just get on with the work. We know where to find each other. We don't need any of this stuff. So again, going back to how do we operate? What's the makeup of our team? How do we work together? So all of those questions for you, all of those questions, just give you a bit of silence. Okay. So the principles, and remember these are principles. You can, the idea is that you adapt them to something that makes sense to you and with the technology you have. Some teams go wild on the tech, others just have email and some video platform, and that's it. So go, these are the three uh, headings. And the first one is deliberate communication. And this is all about what information do I need from a person to do my work day to day? Sometimes I don't need to know anything. Sometimes, you know, I'm working really closely with someone I could do with knowing some stuff about them. And if we go back to how trust is built, we need information. So availability, and this is not about are they available to have a meeting. It's about do they want to spend the whole afternoon on their own doing their work or whatever and don't want to be disturbed? Or, um, or am I okay for collaborative works on Wednesday afternoons, for example? Uh, and then, then you, I am yours. <laughs> you can contact me for whatever. So this is important to make it explicit uh, because if not, that can cause some erosion yeah, in our relationships. Context, especially if it's changing, it's really important to communicate. Again, uh, we might have, let's use this cartoon, and we might have visitors. And if, if we were in an office together, someone might pick up on it. You know, They might have heard us on the phone going, 
Yeah, Sally, yeah, you can stay a whole week and rolling our eyes. But if they haven't been there when we had that phone call with Sally, um, they might not know that. And again, the context and especially a change in context can, um, can affect how we behave and that affects our relationships. And also the context in the organization, because something I'm not really touching on today is if you are working in a virtual team within an organization, that's another level of trust that we need to, to be looking at. And so, especially if you are in a management position or if your team members have access to different networks within the organization, have a process, have a time, have a system where you share what's going on, because that will help you again to um, any kind of sharing of information as well can help you build trust, but also that relationship with the organization. And I've put these guys in a, a call, <laughs> in a meeting to talk about it, but you could have, again, a system, an asynchronous uh, system. In fact, a lot of this stuff is better to do it asynchronously, I think. And finally, your mood. Um, we don't need to tell each other everything, but if I wake up and I'm in a foul mood because I, something happened, I don't want to get feedback from you today. Yeah, but if I haven't told you that that's the mood I'm in and uh, we've been apart and you're working one place, I'm working another, and then you call me up or you send me an email or whatever and say, hey, you know that thing you did? I've got time to give you feedback now. And you catch me by surprise and you know, I don't have the heart to tell you now. But if in the morning we had a system where we put in one channel in Slack or a quick swift email around everyone that said, not feeling great today, then I might wait. So again, it's what, what, is, what kind of communication is going to help us to work better and what effect might this have on trust? And you can see that a lot of these things are to do with affective trust. And you can choose how to do that. You can use your calendars if you don't share them with everyone in the organization. If you've got a small team, you can show your with your calendars, you can show your availability, your context, your mood. Um, you can do it, again, as I said, in a channel in Slack or Microsoft Teams, in a card in Trello. I don't care. You decide what you like. And, uh, or at the beginning of a meeting, if you have daily stand-ups, for example. But that's for you to decide how to do that. So let's move on to the next bit, which is work visibility. And a lot of you are probably already very used to doing this, um, but some people might never have had to do it. So um, open conversations, when I'm talking to someone in the office and I'm having a conversation about work, other people might overhear it. If I only have those conversations now that we're away from each other via a closed system, whether it's a private message or an email that goes to only one or two people, then the rest of the team don't benefit from those conversations. Uh, and the reason for having that is that sometimes the help we need will come from a source we didn't expect, someone else in the team. And also because the conversations we're having can help others with information about the work and what we're doing, but also they can be a point of connection. Remember those task interdependence? We had sometimes in teams, people just go off and do their own task. But sometimes if I have a conversation with you about what I'm working on and someone reads it, it might not be um, interesting to their work, but they might get to know you better as a person. And it might be a point of connection during the day. So again, uh, open um, collaboration platforms, things like Slack, which you can do asynchronously, Teams. In some companies, you'll have blog posts because um, it's not just about the conversations, but also about our thinking. So we'll go to that in a, in a second. But what, however you're doing it, or it can be that you've had a conversation with someone, you make a note that this is something I must share with the team and you share it in, at another moment. For this, you really need to be agreeing. What are the conversations we wanna hear from each other? Because you don't have to have all your conversations in the open. So you really need to be agreeing this. The visible workflow, Kanban boards, a lot of you will be do, doing this. Uh, and again, what level of detail you go into, it, it's up to you. Some people will be, okay, look, we've got a huge deadline on, I don't know, in a month's time, we don't need to know anything. We just get there as we trust that everyone's going to get to it and everyone's tasks are interdependent, so off you go. But in some teams, you might need a little bit more information. Um, and especially for the people who are finding it more difficult to trust. And instead of wanting to pick up the phone or send an email and say, how far are you with that bit of work? If you already have it online and you've agreed that you're going to update it, then you can go and have a look. Visible work, um, anything. I mean, uh, again, Carlos had an example of this. A lot of work being done in the open. 
for the knowledge worker, uh, this could be uh, working in the cloud. Uh, and again, depending on the levels of trust, uh, this might be something that, that you need to think, well, are we happy in our team to share this? So maybe you don't share your work, but you share your thinking. So in a, in a low trust team, or actually in a team that you don't wanna be seeing each other's work for whatever reason, Something about sharing how we're thinking might be interesting and agreeing that once every two weeks we write a blog post or we record a piece of audio, talk of asynchronous communication, audio, uh, record, audio recordings, I think, have a lot of potential. They also have some pitfalls, but a lot of potential to make asynchronous communication more personal rather than reading text more accessible, not everyone likes to write and not everyone likes to type very fast, uh, but sketches also. So again, it's about agreeing, what do we wanna make visible? Is it our thinking or our work? So that's the second part of visible teamwork. And um, this can help to build that cognitive trust. Uh, whether we're new or if we're continue, or we're still working, we've been a team for a while, this can reinforce it because we get to see some of the work and therefore it can help us to see that, uh, well, that the competence is there, the thinking processes. Um, if people are late, we'll sometimes when, when people um, uh, are late with a piece of work or they're behind, the problem sometimes is not that the work is late, but that they haven't told us. So all of this can replace that, which can um, erode trust. However, something that I am thinking and why I wanted to put this to you um, is that we must not let this start to create that lack of trust. I might be doing my work, but I forget to go on the collaboration platform and therefore you think I haven't done it. And then you start going, well, this person, they're not really doing what they said they would do. So beware of that and constantly, constantly review and introduce things one at a time. Uh, or even if you have been working in this way for a while, Go back, is this working for us? What's this doing to our relationships? Finally, the last bit, which is all about finding how to have those interactions that might bring a little bit of joy during our days uh, where we bump into each other in the space or where we have conversations we didn't know we were going to have. And um, this, of course, will be building that effective trust. It will help us to get to know people better, but it can also provide conversations that we didn't know we needed to have then. So for example, uh, if we think back to the office, I might be, uh, I might go on my way to the, I don't know, the photocopier. I see you at your desk. I hear you say something and I'm reminded that I needed to ask you something. So spontaneous interactions can also help with the work. We've got the virtual coffees with everyone has embraced. And this is about turning up and talking about stuff that doesn't have to do with work. And the spontaneity is about who's going to turn up and what the conversations are going to be. So if you don't plan in the online space for spontaneous interaction, they rarely happen. You can plan for them. So you might plan at what time you have your virtual coffees every week, but it's optional and you don't know what you're going to talk about. Um, and this is, again, it's about creating that space for people to get to know each other and also you might know yourself very well, but you might not know how you are with other people. <laughs> and these virtual coffees can help you suss out. Uh, and this sometimes has got nothing to do with whether the team is new or not, but um, so interesting spaces. You can have asynchronous, so uh, in teams where you can't be meeting and having a coffee because logistically it's a nightmare, We're not even talking time zones, we're also talking uh, what's going on around us. Have a space. Again, have a space in Slack, Teams, Trello, have an email once a week where you just share some random stuff and don't forget to celebrate. And uh, this one, uh, meeting in the work, will depend on the kind of systems we have, but don't underestimate things like Google Docs where you might be logged in at the same time as someone else who's on the other side of the world. Connection, uh, spontaneity, oh, I know that you're working there. Oh, a little bit more connection, a little bit more trust maybe. So please put your uh, profile pictures in all your platforms. Any small things in our ecosystem that can help us to connect with the person behind it, really worth uh, investing the two seconds of time it takes. And finally, availability. Again, we're back to the beginning is um, if we want to have a system where we might want to get in touch with each other, just have a system where you can say that you're happy to chat, happy to have 10 minute conversation about what 
whatever. And again, that might help to build that affective trust. So <laughs> building trust, a lot of the time when I hear uh, people talk about it, it's immediately about the virtual coffee. It is much more than that. So um, the, those kind of conversations are usually about building effective trust. But honestly, as you've seen, there's a lot more than that. I'm going to summarize and then I'm going to stop and see what questions we have. Um, but again, let this sit. Some of this for some of you will be like, forget it. This is too much. Uh, we don't need it. For others, especially people who just started, just pick one or two things that you think, actually, this might just help us work better in our team. Remember the tool, the process, the behavior, and you're going to need to agree. It's not enough to say we're going to, you know, I think we should do this. Yeah, but how? And let's agree and put a date on it by which you review it. A mixture, synchronous, asynchronous. Uh, and then a reminder that we want to build interactions with our team members that build affective trust, cognitive trust, and that help us to uh, um, see how benevolent, competent, and how much integrity they have. And the same for your own, for your own uh, behavior. How, how many of those three can we take? And finally, um, this is all great. It doesn't mean that you don't just get to know your people. Just because you distribute it, virtual, not distant, <laughs> just because you distribute it, it doesn't mean that you spend quality time with them, that the, you, you have great feedback sessions with them, that in your team, you take time to help each other, um, that you ask questions, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna now uh, stop what I just wanted to, uh, just in case, just in case I forget afterwards, because I'm going to stop the slideshow. Uh, 21st Century Work Life, come and listen to that. Management Cafe, if you're a manager, I've got a, um, oh no, my team's gone remote season, that about seven episodes. And I also co-host Facilitation Stories and Work Life Psych, and I've got some books. Joao, <laughs> are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> Is anyone else there still? There are, and we have a few questions for you to answer. Are you ready? I am. Go. <laughs> okay. So what is the best way to record a remote team's action to encourage trust? So it will depend. Again, it's uh, if you think if you... Um, so if, for example, if your team really rely on each other doing your tasks uh, at a certain time, record the progress of those tasks so that you can see, so that you can see what is going on and you don't have to be checking in. If, for example, every, uh, you're a knowledge worker and everyone's getting on with their piece of work, open an internal blog post and once every two weeks, uh, have just put down your thinking. If you're making decisions as a manager, as a team member, just share why you've made them, however small, because that will help people understand why. Um, I think it's about surfacing the kind of information that will help us understand why people behave in the way they behave. Perfect. Ready for the second one? Go for it. <laughs> okay. How can you help a manager who is used to close scrutiny adapt to force remote work now? So the good thing, I mean, this, this is a little bit facetious, but the good thing about these systems is that they are open to everyone. So for example, let's go with that one. So visible workflow is great. So just a system, it can be an Excel spreadsheet or a Trello board, whatever, where people say at what stage of the work they're at. If you are a manager who really needs to be knowing this, any time of the day, you can go and have a look at it. You don't have to tell anyone that you're doing this. Plus, team members can also see this. So it's not about you, the manager, managing the work. Uh, sorry, managing the people. It's just about everyone having access to that information. And I think that is the first step. Um, and, and then also, um, again, just ask for more thinking conversations. And... Always ask why people do things. So I kind of explain a little bit behind the decision. Remember that you're not around me all the time. So I think that that can help. Very good. Ready for the next one? Go for it. <laughs> How can we safely let others know our propensity to trust so they understand why we ask certain questions and don't become offended by those questions? That's excellent. Um, I think oh, this will really depend. That's, <laughs> that's huge. That is huge because, because you're bringing in how comfortable you are sharing personal information 
because if you want to share that, um, it brings in that self-awareness. It brings in also having a relationship where we know or trust that others are interested in us as people. So um, it could be, uh, you could, if you use da data, <laughs> so it could be that during a week you think, okay, where are the bits that I am missing information, which means that I don't trust people? Or what are the situations where I realize, hmm, I need more information to trust that person? And if then you can explain to someone, look, in these kind of situations, I need more information, then that might help. Um, and it's, and we don't have to go into why, we might know, but actually it might just be, look, this is how I am. I'm struggling with this a bit for us to work better together. And then ask them, ask them, is this something that you think that we can talk about? Is that something that you need from me to know that we, I've got your back? So make it always a two-way two-way conversation. What determines to truly trust someone? Sometimes at surface, we get the impression of a person being trustworthy, but eventually we realize the opposite is the truth. Yeah. So some people are great at, uh, uh, at, at managing their persona. They're great at knowing what you, um, what you want to hear. So, uh, and, and it's, I think for that, you just need to know this, this, I don't have an answer. I wish I had because I have a huge propensity to trust. Um, and it, it does happen that you think that something is fine. And then, of course, then they show their true colors. The other thing is when you first meet someone, we're all in our best behavior, whether it's a personal relationship or a professional relationship. So I think it's, it, it, you can ask yourself, why do I trust that person? What have they said or what have they done that has made me go, ah, you're okay. And then maybe that can help you to see how real or not that might be. The other thing uh, is that sometimes we trust someone because they remind us of someone else we trusted. So I think being aware of what specifically is helping you to trust that person can help you to then see, yeah, is this true or, you know, is it me or is it them? Do you think that communication, transparency and accountability in processes like OKR can help people learn, trust their coworkers? Yes, they can also destroy them, <laughs> which is why it's... <laughs> However, what is really important, what can really build that trust is setting up those systems. And but I, what I mean is, okay, we're going to set up systems of OKR. Uh, why are we doing this? What information are we passing on to each other? Uh, what's the best way of doing this? And have a real conversation. It's again, similar to the trust thing. Um, okay. Will this help us? What in our work is helping us do that? And as a team, okay, how do individuals feel about that? So I think a lot of this stuff, and the reason why I got into helping organizations transition to remote is that sometimes in doing that, we have conversations we haven't had for ages that we should have had. So have that conversation and also have that time by which you decide, actually, we've had enough of this. Because trust can be broken. If we set up a system, we're all behind it. Some of us continue doing it. Others don't. And we're like, well, who's got each other's back? Um, and what that does, uh, I think, sometimes, and it's going back to that quote of that study, if we have these systems of OKRs, for example, et cetera, maybe we don't even need to trust each other as much anymore because everything's visible. And that might be a good thing. I don't know. Thank you for the questions, my God. Do you recommend the use of a guided mentor or a psychotherapist in order to resolve trust issues? Can you do it within a company as well? <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't uh, say anything like that without knowing anyone's situation. Um, I think there's, there's a difference between a coach and a psychotherapist and the company will probably be able to get you a coach or then refer you to a psychotherapist. So if you really think that that is an issue that you need to solve, try a coach and the coach is not going to go, the coach is about moving you forwards, but what you might need is to go backwards and analyze. So um, look for the kind of uh, help that is going to be more appropriate and you might be able to access some of that help. A lot of um, some companies have uh, well-being systems, they've got all sorts of support, so maybe. Perfect, thank you so much. Pilar, do you agree that remote teams should come together at least once or twice a year? Your presentation has some of Scrum mindset, trust, people, teams. 
Yes, um, it's great if we can do it because, and you know, I've thought a lot about this, um, what getting together once or twice a year does is it gives us all these wonderful times that we would uh, maybe have together if we were co-located, if we were working from the same space. So if you can go out for dinner together, uh, if you can uh, have uh, like really good long conversations without going, oh my God, my eyes, my neck, <laughs> my screen. Um, and also, of course, these team away things, they're just as great for people working in the office all the time because it takes you away from your normal uh, surroundings. And even that might just go click. Okay, we connect differently. I get to know myself in a different way. Uh, but the good thing is to structure them uh, knowing why you're doing them. And that can help you to say, okay, well, we need more of this, more of that. And if you can, it's, yeah, it's great to know why you're doing them and to plan for them. Last question. Thank you for your points. I'm still not sure I trust you with my cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, because that is a very good point, uh, which, uh, which I'm not going to elaborate on because I think it makes the point really well. Does that mean I need to work on my trust? Is there such thing as improving our trust? Well, if our job, if my, actually, I'll tell you what, and, and this is, it's going back to a serious point. I think it's a wonderful uh, comment. If my job is to look after your cat, then you need to trust me with my cat. If the work that we do together is writing blog posts every two weeks, then you don't need to trust me with your cat. And I think this is really interesting when we're talking about trust is, do you trust me? about what, you know, I trust you with what. And we don't need to trust each other with our cats in our teams, unless we are, you know, cat people, uh, but there's other things that we need to be looking at. And the more specific we can be, the better. Pilar, thank you so much for an amazing lecture. It was really inspiring. Special thanks to our break sponsors, Landing Jobs, and for making this event possible. Pilar, do you want to say one last thing before we go? Yes, I'm really looking forward to the next few talks. <laughs> so thank you very much, Joao. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, uh, thank you, Pedro, for organizing. And uh, thank you for watching, uh, viewers. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Pilar. See you in a bit, guys. In 15 minutes.